So we begin our post-lunch session. I'd just like to thank our sponsors before we move on to our first session. In association with NewsX, associate sponsors, we are Mall Chennai, Fresh Food Partner, ID Foods, session sponsor, United India Insurance, bookstore partner, Higgin Bothams, water partner, Archie Water, Wi-Fi partner, ACT, radio partner, Fever FM, and the festival is brought to you by Theme. And I'd also like to remind those on active on social media, you can follow us on Hindu, the Hindu Lit for Life page on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're posting anything about the festival, please do so. Hashtag LFL 2019. Sexual persona, overcoming prejudice and misconception about sexuality. That's the session now. Nandini Krishnan and Madhavi Menon will be in conversation with Susan Hawthorne. Nandini, a writer, dancer, and stage actor, is the author of two books of nonfiction, Invisible Men, Inside India's Trans Masculine Networks, and Hitched, The Modern Woman and Arranged Marriage. Professor of English at Ashoka University and the author of Infinite Variety, A History of Desire in India, which is Madhvi Menon's recent work. She's written several books on Shakespeare and queer theory. Currently, she's working on a book about the laws governing sexuality in India, titled The Law, law of Desire. Poet, novelist, nonfiction writer, and co-founder of Spinifex, Press, Susan Hawthorne has been adjunct professor in the College of Arts, Society and Education, James Cook University, Townsville. Susan had, has had three international residencies in India, and you should know at the University of Madras, Italy and Turkey. She's also published a chapbook, her verse novel, Lemon, a poetry collection, Lupa and Lamb, a non-fictional work, Bibliodiversity, a manifesto for independent publishing, and most recently, a novel, Dark Matters. She's been studying Sanskrit for a decade and works with many Indian publishing houses. Thank you so much. I welcome the speakers. Thank you so much um, for that introduction and also for the invitation to be here. Um, it's so nice to be in a place with good weather. Um, <laughs> I think Chennai has fabulous weather. I have not been here in May, which I gather <laughs> is a little hot. But I live in a place that's hot in a similar way, so that's, I'd be quite happy to come in May. Um, so today's session, we'll be talking mostly about two books. This one by Madhavi called Infinite Variety, A History of Desire in India. and. This one by um, having a, uh, Nandini, <laughs> having a mental block, <laughs> Nandini Krishnan, um, called Invisible Men Inside India's uh, Trans Masculine Networks. And as you can see, they're very big books, <laughs> and this is a huge subject, and we have just 50 minutes. So we should expect that we won't cover uh, the whole ground. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that, that I have been um, hos uh, and the hospitality here I'm getting is, is through the festival. I'm very thankful to that. Um, so let's start with some questions. <laughs> so um, to both of you, um, there's always something that sparks the writing of a book. And I think it's interesting to think about how that happens. So could you tell me, Nandini, what was it that drove you to write your book, Invisible Men? Um, I, I think it started much, much, much earlier than, um, than my journey with um, writing books began. So um, when you grow up in India, and I mean, since you've spent a fair amount of time in India, you're familiar with this, that we see trans women very often um, on the roads and typically uh, on trains, uh, usually asking for money. Um, and it's associated largely with harassment uh, by the people whom they ask money of. And, and when I grew up 
uh, as a child, uh, to be honest, I found trans women very frightening. Um, my brothers were terrified of trans women because they were used to being harassed on trains by trans women. So we had a very stilted view of trans people. Um, and I think it was when I watched Boys Don't Cry, the Hilary Swank film, that I realized that trans men existed. Um, and that was a revelation to me, because like most people, I'd confused trans women with intersex people. Um, as a child, I didn't realize that it was a deliberate journey towards changing one's body. Um, so uh, I started working on a documentary when I was a student in the UK in 2005, uh, which was the year that the, the, the that an act recognizing civil partnerships between people of any gender and also uh, uh, the right to change one's gender came about. So my journey with trans, trans rights began in the UK um, and I started making a documentary and then I decided to compare trans rights in the West to trans rights in India. And uh, initially I interviewed a lot of trans women and then, and then one of them asked me would you would you like to meet somebody who's the opposite of us? And I said, what do you mean the opposite? Because to me, the opposite of a trans person would be cis person. And then she said, no, like, he is a woman who's become a man. And I said, okay, that's interesting. And that's how I met Selvam, who has become sort of a very good friend over the last decade and also the primary uh, character in, in my book. Um, and through him, I, and I lost touch with him after 2006 because this was before mobile phones were ubiquitous in India. And uh, I met him again 10 years later and he had changed completely in, in, in terms of appearance, but his vibe was exactly the same, which led me to question what is it that makes us male or what is it that makes us female? And uh, therein began a journey first for a long form piece uh, for Fountain Ink magazine. And then I felt that there was so much more which I couldn't cover in just 8,000 words and therefore I wrote 500 pages and <laughs> Penguin was kind enough to publish it. Yeah, so so um, Nandini, you've travelled all over India uh, to write your book. But Madhavi, what you've done is you've travelled back through time. Uh, and so we've got this very broad contemporary book but we've also got this very long book um, through time. Could you talk to me about what it is that made you write your book, Infinite Desire? Right. Infinite uh, Variety. Infinite Sorry. Variety, yeah. Um, I mean, it's in, since I'm a professor, it's, it's harder for me to answer questions about how I started writing <laughs> since, you know, that's what we do, we do all the time. But, um, there's a way in which, for me, since I was trained as a Shakespearean, the relationship between the past and the present has always been an important one. How do you talk about the past from a position in the present? How does the past affect the present? Uh, can we, are we being presentist when we talk about the past? Is the past dead and gone, or does it continue to haunt the present? I mean, these are ideas that I've always had to deal with and had to work with, and I'm very interested in. Um, equally, uh, there is a sense of so there's a ten sense of time, of chronology, but there's also a sense of culture or geography, which is um, how do you speak about desires that actually don't know national boundaries or borders, right? Um, and so even the title of my book, which is Infinite Variety, colon, A History of Desire in India, the phrase infinite variety is a quote from Shakespeare's play, Antony and Cleopatra, where he's describing Cleopatra's ability to cross-dress actually, while, while having sex. So there's the sense of, I, I don't like drawing borders. I am a bit allergic to boundaries. And so whether it's a boundary of chronology, or it's a boundary of geography, or it's a boundary of culture, I feel desire becomes the thing that militates against all boundaries. Which is why, of course, most people are terrified of desire. Which is why so many legal systems try and legislate against desire. And so for me, all these questions cluster together in thinking about this book. And in many ways, I mean, you know, these are the questions that have motivated all my writing. Uh, because if you think about desire rather than, say, gender or sexuality, you have a much more open space to traverse. So your um, historical pro uh, process 
is, um, well, it, it's partly thinking about the past, but it's also going back through things like mythology and, and history and so forth. So, and you look at the chapters in your book, and it's such a weird list of titles. <laughs> I really didn't know what it was that I was going to encounter, yeah. you know, in coming to your book. Yeah, much like desire, right? We don't, al <laughs> we don't always know what we're going to encounter. Uh, but, but actually, I, I wouldn't say that my process is historical. Because as you note, so this, this book has 20 very short chapters. So don't let the number daunt you. They're very short chapters. Um, and I tried to organize this book around everyday objects and ideas and institutions and cultures. And so rather than thinking about desire as this unreachable, unknowable, esoteric thing that everyone giggles about when we talk about it, or that parents tell their children not to think about, or that, you know, whatever it is, this thing that is out of bounds. I wanted to think about desire at an everyday level. Because, in fact, one of my arguments is that every part of our lives, every single day, has some association with desire. So, for instance, what we decide to do with our hair has everything to do with desire. How we are educated has everything to do with desire. The grammar of the language that we speak has everything to do with desire. Now, you know, the sort of current conversation around pronouns has everything to do with desire. So there is a sense of every single day we are living different, living out relationships to different aspects of desire. And I think we need to take those seriously, rather than saying mythology or, you know, all those things that seem out of reach, that do not seem every day. I'm very interested in anchoring this in the quotidian, in the daily, in the dailiness of how we live our lives. Because I think that we are all drenched in desire and we shouldn't avert our gaze or giggle when we think about it because that's who we are. Um, Nandini, could you say something about the process? Because clearly you had to go to a lot of different places. You had to meet heaps of different people coming from a huge range of different perspectives and you've come ha somehow managed to pull all that together and have it make sense. Thank so, you. <laughs> You know, something about your process in, in doing that. Um, I think part of it was that um, I, when we think about well, what Madhavi said about desire, there are various ways of curtailing desire and there's various ways of making people conform. And I found that often culture, religion, and language, um, just the fact that, I mean, I, I was speaking to one of the people I mentioned in my book is Maya Sharma, who is a very prominent uh, 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 maybe first generation feminist in India, or second generation feminist in India, as well as someone who came out as a lesbian in, in the early 90s. And, and she said the word lesbian was not commonly used. And, and a lot of the rural lesbians she spoke to wouldn't know the word. So they would either say, yeah, I like women, or I don't like men. And there were no words. So language, as well as religion and culture, were used to subdue various expressions of one's desire or sexuality. And so I thought it was important to look at a cross-section of people who cut across languages and regions. Um, regions of conflict, for instance, were particularly relevant to my book because uh, in places like Kashmir and Manipur where the AFSPA is in force, um, people are subject to bodily checks. And, and one of my stand-up comedian friends often says that India is the only country where women get massages by women and men get massages by men, you know. And, and I think with security checks, uh, gender again comes into play, where you're asked to go to a women's line and a men's line. Uh, and, and then I found that this would happen with bathrooms, this would happen with everything. So, um, and marriage again, uh, across, across regions and religions and um, cultures, the approach to marriage varies, so which is what made me want to look at a spectrum of people across India, across age, across ages as well. So my youngest interviewee is 12 years old, and the oldest is 57 years old. And I've interviewed people of all religions, including um, non-religion atheism, um, and and from Kashmir to uh, Tamil Nadu, the southern parts of Tamil Nadu, from Gujarat to Manipur and beyond. So, that, so my process entailed a lot of travel, uh, but it also, because when you meet somebody once, you get to know them all right, but they think they have to give you a very 
concise, precise interview. Um, and you don't get to know the person. You get to hear a story. You don't get to know a life. So I had to make multiple trips across the country. And then I would keep in touch with them by email and, and, and through WhatsApp messages. And many of them would send me voice messages. And, and it was very interesting because uh, so much of, so much of, um, I, I realized how much one loses just through expression of one's gender or one's sexuality. Where education gets cut off, for instance, uh, because you can no longer wear a uniform that you're forced to wear. Um, you can no longer conform to certain things you're expected to conform to. So gender comes into play in so many ways. And one, one of my interviewees had dropped out of school after three days when he was five years old. And so he didn't have language in, 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 in written form. So he would just send me WhatsApp voice messages, um, so, which, is, which is also what you find in, in my book. So it was a very scattered journey. And as you can tell, I speak in a very scattered way about it in person, and I speak in an even more scattered way about it in my book. Yeah, well, it's interesting to see, you know, the, the excerpts from the WhatsApp and the, the film interviews and other things. It's, it's actually um, very wide ranging. So both of you have written fairly controversial things in your books. Um, Mandavi, what do you think is the most controversial thing that you say in your book? And have you had any wild reactions? Um, no, no wild <laughs> reactions. No swinging from the chandeliers. Um, it's interesting. I think one of the things I say in my book that would be absolutely and utterly controversial in the West, and I don't mean to use the West as a homogenous entity, but I, I generally mean non-subcontinental lands. A thing that would be very controversial in the West is my argument that identity or naming of identities can actually be a trap rather than a release. But it hasn't had any kind of pushback as yet in India, because I think that is very much our lived reality. Um, when Nandini said how she heard about or met rural lesbians who had no idea what the word lesbian is, that is true for over 90% of people in this country who might not have normative heterosexual desires. Um, and, and there is a way in which a certain very small subsection of um, non-heteronormative people in India embrace a very Western language and a discourse of pride and homosexuality and gays and lesbians as language and as terminology, um, and understandably so, because it gives them access to a global audience, it gives them access to a much wider network, and that's completely understandable. But my question always has been, um, does it make sense to have pride marches in India when shame has not been the overwhelming principle associated with non-normative sexualities here? So when you have a sort of Judeo-Christian background in which sexuality is narrated largely, if not entirely, in the register of shame, the idea of pride makes perfect sense. But then when you are among traditions in which Shame actually, if at all it is associated with sexuality, tends to be associated with heterosexuality in India, then that idea of pride doesn't make as much sense. So for me, the question of identity, the question of terminology, the question of categorization is, is a very important and interesting one. And I think it's one of the many things that I feel the Indian subcontinent has been way ahead discursively and, and materially of many, many other parts of the world. Which is why it's so ironic that now when other parts of the world are beginning to sort of get on board with actually seeing non-normative people as human beings, um, India now is starting to talk, uh, speak this discourse of saying, oh, these are all foreign conspiracies, right? There's no homosexuality in India. There's no nothing in India. We only have rigid men, rigid women. Everything else is a foreign hand, whatever that is. And so this sort of irony of history, the irony of politics, the way in which we are rushing around the world away from any kind of expansive politics towards an increasingly narrow idea of what life should be like is absolutely, I think, distressing to me and shocking. And, and we really need to work against that. Um, but the only other thing, and we may not want to talk about it today, that 
not this book, but uh, subsequent um, uh, sort of appearances in relation to the book. I have a chapter in this book on Ayyappan, who's at the center of the Shabrimala controversy now. And so I've had to speak a lot about that and have got a lot of pushback and hatred around that. But you know, hatred seems to be de rigueur these days. Yes, it does, doesn't it? And I think, I think Nandini has something to say about that because you have had, um, you, well, your book, I think, was burnt very yeah, recently. a few days early because today's the day you're supposed to be burning things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Manipur got way ahead of uh, time with it. No, I mean, there's, there's, there's no shortage of hatred. And uh, you know, Madhavi began speaking about controversial things in, in her book. And I'm finding out every day that there's a new controversy of which I wasn't aware. Um, what I thought would be controversial in my book was uh, speaking about religion um, in, in the sense of speaking about how the Abrahamic religions uh, say very strong things against both homosexuality and uh, transitioning gender. But I've suddenly, uh, that, that hasn't come up at all which surprised me. Uh, the first thing which came up was why is somebody who identifies as cisgender and heterosexual writing about this and, and why is a cisgender heterosexual man writing the foreword and the foreword is written by Manu Joseph who is I think no stranger to controversy to put it mildly. Um, and um, so that was how it started and then and I use a lot of mythology in the book and I find mythology very interesting because I don't think mythology and religion should be conflated. I don't think the myths came down to us or the scriptures for that matter, like you know those food packets from rescue helicopters that are just thrown down from the heavens and you run to pick them up. I think mytholo mythology was manufactured largely by people of a certain vague time. And it gives you a lot of um, insight into how people thought at that time. Um, I don't like, I mean, it's quite popular in the Indian Science Congress to suggest that the blueprint for the aeroplane was in the Ramayana, or that uh, the concept of IVF and stem cell research is to be found in the Mahabharata. But then I don't think that's the case because I don't think we have working models for any of those in, in those scriptures. But it does tell you a lot about how, what people desired or feared. Like in Greek mythology, Hermes' appearance at, at, at various points and through various uh, geographical sp uh, spaces probably suggests that people would like to be able to teleport themselves. Um, not that they had found a way to do it, but it tells you that perhaps they wanted to and they had thought of it and, and, and the, number of, uh, the number of animals that have mated with gods and produced weird beings in Greek mythology probably hints at people thinking about bestiality. So there are various suggestions that one can infer and I found it fascinating that so much of mythology across regions, across the globe, speaks about gender transition. Um, and for that matter, so, so does Shakespeare. So was it a very convenient device since all the actors were men and they could go back to maybe getting rid of their corsets and, and their skirts and speaking in their voices for a chunk of the play? Or was he actively thinking of gender transition? So there were, so all these things came into play for me, but uh, people who haven't read the book, and I think usually people who get offended by books are the ones who haven't read them and have no intention of doing so. Um, so they got offended and they thought I was speaking about mainstream Hindu mythology and, um, and, and, and imposing it on a region like Manipur, which has its own uh, tribal mythology. And I said, well, great, if you have tribal mythology that I could use, you know, handy. But then you haven't told me any stories that I could use uh, with in, in the context of gender transition. And I, I don't think mythology and religion ought to be confused. Um, but that's been a controversy. And then I speak about veganism. Because like we were speaking about the pride parades. Um, intersectionality is a byword in India now. Um, and you often have... Uh, with the beef ban coming in and, and with, this with this government being so, uh, so protective of the cow um, and various versions of the cow, um, I, I think it is important to talk about, it, it's important to talk about uh, right-wing notions of various kinds, but then I found it strange that people who saw themselves as oppressed would also believe in the oppression of animals. 
uh, would how could you be subject to one kind of oppression and not be against another kind so i spoke about how being vegan i could not really see that point of view see why uh, why things like why things like brahmanism and the beef ban and so on were being uh, brought into pride parades and and i was called casteist which is strange because uh, the the uh, the idea behind being vegan is that you think all life is equal which is exactly the opposite of the idea behind caste wow <laughs> interesting range of things to be nailed for as it were um actually coming to both of your books as a lesbian activist myself um i was also really interested to know the different ways in which you touched on on uh lesbian history lesbian desire and and so forth and madavi how do you think uh, the the way in which you've written your book how lesbian desire figures historically and c- continuing the, the the discussion about religion and mythology and so forth how do you think that that plays into the perceptions of lesbian sexuality Oh uh, well both of you but yeah okay you want you want I'll me to start, start with you yeah well i i um i mean it's it's an interesting question and i i just wanted to hold up the cover of my book to all of you um and it has as you can see two women on the cover and this is from a wall painting in uh, Rajasthan uh, dating from the 18th century and a lot of people who see this cover which i love uh, for the image for the colors for everything Uh, a lot of people who look at this cover assume that they are two lesbians on the cover uh, two women sort of sexually and romantically involved with w- involved with one another um and that may well be the case but one of the arguments i make in the book and one of the things i say in the book is that we don't know that we don't know if they are friends we don't know if they are lovers we don't know if they are sisters we don't know if they are mother and daughter we don't know and for me there is something about that not knowingness that i feel it's important to hang on to and to hold on to uh precisely because it gives us opportunities to be more than any one thing because we can be multiple we are multiple and we should be allowed to be multiple um which is my argument with um with identity categories is that it seems to be on the one hand extremely liberatory and again i can completely understand why it would feel that way extremely liberatory to say your name for me is not my name and my name is something else but the minute the state sanctions your name the minute it becomes yet another bureaucratic box what you're doing is rather than expanding and making more plural the desires that we can uh, pick and choose from what we are increasing is the multiple sites of homogeneity so you're saying you can either be straight or you can be a lesbian or you can be bisexual or you can be whatever five categories the state is going to recognize for you at that point and i think there's a real politics in saying none of the above which is also a way of saying all of the above which is also a way of saying this in the morning this in the afternoon and this day after tomorrow and i think we want to hang on to that because it is a way of speaking back to the state in a language that is not the state's language it is a way of saying to them i am not playing your game according to your rules because i have available to me i have access to multiple other sets of rules which actually allow me more space and perhaps more importantly allow everyone around me more space than your rule is going to right and this is of course also an argument and again we might not want to go into that um into sort of rights based activism or rights based discourse because it's always then rights for me that rather than for for all of us and so there is a way in which um identity categories for me are always vexed are always problematic we have to give in to them so many times in our lives we have to tick that one box so many times in our lives that i really hope that when there are moments where we can resist that that we will do that you know and the state if you just sort of see and 
you probably know about this already, Susan, the transgender bill that this government has tried to ram through despite opposition from lots of transgender activists and lots of, lots of us is completely in opposition to the Supreme Court judgment on transgender. Because the Supreme Court judgment, as many of you will remember, said there is no need to have any kind of physical, biological conformity to the category that you want to identify as. You can be whatever you want to be, no matter what your body looks like. And the government, which of course is, is, is smart in these regards, honed in on that and said, this is the weak spot. Because suddenly if we allow people to be whatever they want to be, it's going to be anarchy. Because sudden, the next people are going to say, oh, we're not going to uh, be religious fundamentalists. What are we going to do then? Um, so there is a way in which, and so the government has changed that. And now has said, you have to pass a test conducted by a board which has a medical examiner on it. Right? So this medicalization of identity, the medicalization of discourse, very much militates to my mind against ideas of desire. Uh, that to me really allow us access to a way of being in the world that is not dictated to us by a bureaucracy. I think that governments are always looking for ways to divide and conquer. Yeah. And in a way, I think that you've just highlighted that. Yeah. Um, uh, Nandini, you have something to say. <laughs> um, no, I, I was just taking off from what, from what Madhuri said about, about uh, having a, 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 a sort of board to scrutinize whether somebody is trans enough to be sanctioned as trans. Um, and the government also insists on surgeries, uh, which some people might not want to have. Um, and um, so, so to go back to your earlier question about, about coming at this as a, as, a, as, a, as a lesbian activist, there's been a lot of confusion down the ages, particularly before surgery, about whether somebody identified as lesbian, as butch lesbian or as trans, um, or was trying to pass as a man, or just simply desired women. Um, so a lot of the early trans men whom I speak about, I myself am not sure whether they were lesbian or whether they were trans. And Maya Sharma, whom I mentioned earlier as the person who says there was no word for lesbian, speaks of a, a, a very early uh, a, a person who um, called Narayan Chitravali. Uh, and Maya is not sure whether that person is a lesbian or a trans man either, and what pronoun to use. So all these are debates which are coming in. And for instance, when one reads Alison Bechdel, uh, she often speaks about disliking her breasts. But she speaks in great detail about desire, about, about sexuality, about exploring sexuality, about orgasms. Um, and all the trans men whom I spoke to, most of them said that they did not like being pleasured as women. Uh, and I did not ask about their sex lives, but many of them volunteered the information and someone said, uh, I want you to note this down, that I've never been pleasured as a woman. Um, I haven't, I, all the women that I've been with, I haven't acknowledged my female um, uh, sort of sexual or secondary sexual organs. Um, and I found that very interesting. The, what are the distinctions, for instance, between, between lesbian identified women, between non-gender conforming people, between uh, trans men, between butch lesbians. And so there are, there are so many categories. And at one point, Sunil, whom I'd interviewed for the book, says something which I found very interesting, um, where Sunil, who doesn't use a pronoun and goes by, uh, and I said, what shall I say? Shall I say S when I want to use a pronoun? And S said, go ahead. Um, so S said, so you have three categories of gender, you know, male, female, transgender, or male, female, intersex. And then from this, you make 10 categories. And at every stage, people will fall out. So any category that you offer is, in a way, exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And I found the politics of that very interesting. Why is it that our minds are constantly searching out these boxes? And that's what the transgender bill is all about. It's all about putting people into boxes and determining how they can live based on those boxes or what, what jobs they can get based on those boxes or what percentage of uh, jobs or education will be accessible uh, depending on those boxes. What do you tick in terms of your caste, in terms of your gender, in terms of your age? And so the politics of categories 
also plays into the politics of desire and into the politics of gender. You, you just mentioned Sunil and I had made a note of something that S said, which was um, for, trans, for the trans women community, there is a history, there are mythologies. For female born sexual and gender minorities, there is no such space. We're always under the control of the system. Our sexuality and gender expressions are regulated according to a system that denies our existence. And I was thinking about this because as a lesbian, this erasure of our culture is exactly the same. So there is, there's no really big gap between what trans women are experiencing and what lesbians yes. are experiencing. So, um, I mean, this is complicated, but can you talk about the intertwining of mythologies and the hard reality of daily life? <laughs> well, uh, because Madhavi mentioned Ayappa a little earlier, and Ayappa features in my book, because Ayappa is believed to be the son of Shiva and Mohini, who is the female form of Vishnu, mm -hmm. uh, who is also a god. So basically, was it two men having sex to produce a child? Was it a man and a trans woman, or was it magic? You know, just like magic. magic. <laughs> <laughs> I love the answer of magic. <laughs> so, so what, what does mythology say about desire? What does it say about gender transition? Um, so I think, so, so what the point that Sunil was making was that trans women also have mythology. There's, there's the Aravan tradition in Tamil Nadu, the Kutandava tradition, where, where it is believed that um, in the, during the Kuvagam festival, a lot of trans women portray this ritual of marrying the god, the sort of minor god Aravan. Uh, and that's also a myth from the Mahabharata, where, where again, whenever, it was, whenever they needed a woman to do something important and sort of temporarily feature in a prominent role, Vishnu was willing to transition into Mohini, do the job, and then transition back. So, uh, so that's what happens with Aravan. Uh, so Mohini, has sex with Aravan, uh, and therefore the trans women have mythology. So, so, so I said, what about Amba and Shikhandi? Because Amba becomes Shikhandi, so it's uh, someone who is born uh, in, into a female body, who transitions into a male body in order to kill Bhishma, which again is a, uh, Bhishma's major crime in Amba's life was denying her expression of sexual desire by kidnapping her and therefore making her inaccessible to any man, you know. And then he said, oh wait, you know, I can't have sex either, so I can't marry you either. So, uh, oh well, sorry, but you're going to be virgin for life. And, 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 and so Amba becomes Shikhandi. And I said, isn't that gender transition from female to male? And Sunil said, no. Um, ask, ask anyone what they think about it and people will tell you Shikhandi is a hijra uh, and a, a, a sort of male to female trans person and I said that makes no sense. So I found it very interesting how through history there's been erasure of, of women's desire as women. There's also been erasure of men's desire when they were female to male uh, transitioning people. So like, like, I mean, Shikhandi did have a wife, uh, but that story is, is, is not mentioned in most versions of the Mahabharata. It's not mentioned in popular versions of the Mahabharata, not in the serialized versions of the film versions. Do you think that's been censored out? <laughs> I don't know, perhaps because, yeah. Just a question. Uh, perhaps it just wasn't important enough. Perhaps it wasn't important enough, because the legend goes that on, on Shik Shikhandi married a woman, and uh, so on the wedding night, when, which was the first time they had sex, because that's what you do, um, Shikhandi's wife was like, oh wait, I thought I was marrying a man, but then he doesn't seem to have all the organs I've heard that men have. And so a delegation was sent to check on Shikhandi's uh, private parts. And, and so Shikhandi runs off into a forest to commit suicide and happens to run into a yaksha who by magic gives him those organs. So was it, was it the first undocumented transgender surgery in, in India? We don't know. Um, I mean, the, the discussion around mythologies and stuff I could go on with for hours, but we also need to, um, there's a couple of other things I want to ask you, one of which is section 377. 
has the change in that made any difference at all in the lives of people that you're talking about, um, you know, gays, lesbians, trans, whichever, whoever wants to. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, I mean, again, I think with Section 377, I have a, a, a somewhat, not controversial stand maybe, but a somewhat more expensive stand. Um, I think it was absolutely brilliant and fabulous for the Supreme Court to say, uh, to strike down 377 and this particular clause that says um, carnal intercourse against the order of nature is illegal. Um, I think there was brilliant, long overdue, and it's a fact to be celebrated by all of us. However, I also think legally it was b a bit of a lost opportunity because the law said what I just quoted, right? It's, it's literally a two-line law that says carnal intercourse against the order of nature is illegal. Doesn't mention by whom, doesn't mention where, doesn't mention between what parties. And I think making this a problem about homosexuality actually has reduced the efficacy. So now a lot of people are able to say, oh, that's their problem, not mine. Whereas technically, carnal intercourse against the order of nature, which would mean any non-reproductive sex is illegal, which is to say every single sexually active person in this country falls under the ambit of 377. And so if we had expanded that idea and said, this affects every one of us, we should all be outraged by this idea of nature, this idea of the natural, this idea of sort of penalizing people for doing this and not that. If we had all united and said this is about every one of us, I think that would have been a golden opportunity to practice that kind of expansive politics that I think desire allows us to practice. In practical terms, there is no doubt that this is going to put police people and um, sort of petty arms of the bureaucracy and the law very much on caution, very much at notice that that kind of harassment and bullying uh, will, not be, you know, will not take place under the ages of 377 any longer. But other than that, which is a big part of our everyday reality, other than that, um, the idea of sort of being non-normative sexually actually is fairly widespread already on a daily basis, right? We all have that uncle or that aunt in our family who never got married, but who has that best friend who happens to be a man or, or a woman, and have, you know, have always lived with them, go on holidays with them, and um, everyone's been fine. The sky has not fallen in or fallen down. So I think it makes a big difference in practical purposes with the police and bureaucracy, but I think in terms of actual uh, everyday reality, uh, I'd like to think uh, that we've already, always been okay with it. Now, I did get the 10-minute <laughs> sign over here. Should be good. So I think we need to um, go to you uh, and get some questions from the audience. So who has a question? The hand up just over here. Over here. Uh, okay. uh, if I can ask a question. Uh, hang on. No, let, sure. let, uh, let her ask her question. Um, so I have, like, two questions. Kind of noted it down. So, uh, uh, one of you, I mean, Madhavi, you said uh, India didn't exactly need pride, uh, pride parades. Um, could you elaborate on that? Do you want to ask your second question yeah, as well? Sure. Or do you? Yeah. And uh, this was purely mythology based. I'm pretty interested in mythology. And you said uh, Shikendi was um, uh, MTF, transgender? So no, female to male, isn't it? Because Shamba was female huh. and Shikhandi is male, so female to male. Yeah. But okay. it's understood as male to female largely. Yeah, so how is that? That's my question exactly. How is that? Why 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 is huh. that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I I, th I mean I'm happy to uh, explain some more. I, th I I I hoped I had said it before. You see, the entire discourse of pride is such a powerful one when you are combating an atmosphere of shame, right? And so pride parades, pride marches, the idea of pride in the West, especially in the US, arose as a, um, as a rhetorical, political, emotional response to an all-pervasive atmosphere of shame. Now when, and so when we look at that in that context, pride makes absolute sense. 
But when you look at the Indian context, and when I mean Indian, I mean really the subcontinent. When, I, when you look at the subcontinental context, this idea of shame is certainly by no means the overwhelming idea that we have had in relation to our sexual realities or sexual desires. Certainly, you can say over the last 200 or 250 years of colonial encounter, there has been more of an idea of shame. But even then, the sort of desi twist to that um, is because people now assume it's most shameful for heterosexuality to exist, right? So for instance, if, a, if two women wanted to go off on holiday together, their parents would say, great, go for it. And if an unmarried girl and boy want to go on holiday together, they'll say, oh my god, don't you have any shame? And, and so it's, it's so interesting that here it is heterosexuality that bears the burden. And there are complex reasons for that. So the idea of pride as the overarching language of resistance to, um, to narrow sexual identity doesn't quite apply in this context. And so that's why I'm not sure importing wholesale that discourse of shame serves us quite as well. Yeah. Because um, people or let's say parents don't normally expect uh, people to be like anything other than heterosexuality. Yeah. And in India, there's a rigid concept of virgin till marriage, which is absurd in itself. Yeah. So I think that's why people are, I mean, like uh, mostly adults or actually even the uh, younger generations who've been molded by those adults yeah. are like fine with two women walking together or two guys walk but no see this is the point it's two women walking together with hands held it's not a problem but if two men do it they're automatically categorized as gay without no other thought process to it really i know that's not disagree. that's not the world in which i live yeah. men are always holding hands putting arms around each other sleeping on the same bench while they're sunning themselves in delhi's cold winter always so and long may that continue to be the case but you're absolutely right that there is a large part of phobia attached to the shame that we attach to heterosexuality, right? Because we assume that's the only location for sex, that two women cannot have sex or two men cannot have sex. And there is a part of that, certainly. But I do think there is also a large part that is a historical memory that we carry with us in which that kind of sexual encounter was not, in fact, that absurd. There was another yeah. question over here. Yeah, uh, my question is for Madhavi. And uh, before I ask the question, I want to make a recommendation that all men please read her book. <laughs> It'll change you thank radically you. as it's changed mine. The thank women you, too, thank huh? you very much. <laughs> uh, so Madhavi, my question to you is when I was reading through the, uh, through the book, I realized that uh, uh, you were running through the landscape of sexuality and desire through a Freudian lens. And do you think you can gather objectivity of desire through that particular lens? I mean, that's interesting you should say that. I'm not, um, uh, and to an extent it's true. I'm not sure that I have any one lens through which I, I look at these phenomena, and I think that's as it should be. But what was interesting to me, uh, and I think this goes back to some other conversations as well, what was interesting to me is that uh, thinking mythologically, one of the um, myths about Kama, the Hindu god of desire, is that he doesn't have a body. So the story goes that um, Shiva was deep in meditation for thousands of years. The other gods wanted to break his penance because, as I keep saying, gods of a pantheon are always up to mischief, always up to no good, always trying to sort of, you know, edge each one out. Um, so they want to wake up Shiva so that he has sex with Parvati because they need an offspring of theirs to defeat some demon or the other, right? There's never a dull moment uh, in these pantheons. And so Shiva wakes up and is so incensed and angry at Kama that he burns him to a cinder with his third eye. And Parvati says, this is very distressing. How can you burn Kama? Please revive him. And Shiva says, I'll bring him back to life, but without a body. And so throughout our understanding among Hindu traditions. Kama, the god of romance, love, desire, sex, has no body. One of the most powerful insights of Freudian psychoanalysis in the early part of the 20th century in Europe is that the body is not the be all and end all of desire, of sexual desire. That in fact, our desires can be engaged by multiple objects. That somatic satisfaction does not mean the end of desire. 
So that the minute you have sexual intercourse, for instance, doesn't mean your desire just vanishes somewhere and, and goes away. And so to me, what's fascinating is that idea that desire does not belong to, exclusively belong to, or can be contained by a body alone. That there are multiple sites of desire, that there are multiple modes of desire, that there are multiple means of thinking about desire. And so to that extent, I think Freud for me is, is very important, but only because it has this, and this goes back to your first question about thinking about history, because these borders that we draw between India and say Europe, for instance, these are ideas that have been in circulation and have different iterations in different parts of the world on multiple occasions. And I think that's fascinating to see that as well. Now, I'm actually being told that it's a wrap. Does anybody have a question for Nandini? Yeah, uh, I just have a, I'll make it two questions short. And I just want to know your opinion on them. So it's like the first one is, um, what is your take on the you know, uh, the recent movement regarding gender pronouns and uh, it being called as hate speech and infringing on the freedom of speech. That is one thing. And two, regarding the absolute uh, gender fluidity and its impacts on sports. For example, there's this case of, you know, uh, in MMA and kickboxing and all. Yeah. Men who have then, you know, identified as women go and, uh, you know, it's an easy battle for them. They easily ri rise up the ranks and you could even see that in, uh, you know, sp uh, sprinting races and right. all that. You're talking too. about Kastya Semenya, Shanti Soundarajan May and Fla that sort of. I think right. Mary Flavor, I forgot the Pinky, name. Yeah. Right. So it was a guy yeah. who then yeah. went to the women's MMA and all that. So there is a difference between men and female bodies, what they say. And I just want to know your opinion on the two questions See, that I asked. Uh, okay, so th there have been lots of controversies in athletics regarding intersex people such as Kastya Semenya and Shanti Soundarajan. And I think the South African government did a fantastic job of standing up for Kastya Semenya, whereas the Indian government completely let Shanti Soundarajan down. So I think where intersex people are concerned, it's like being tall or having longer legs, you know, you're just given, you just have a natural advantage when you have more testosterone in your body. No, uh, yeah, I, 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 get your, I get your question, but you're, if, it's, if it's about sports, there's, there, there's that as well. And then you have uh, male to female trans people, or female to male trans people, as you said, where, um, so you, you do understand that when someone transitions from male to female, uh, there is, and, and does that with medical aid, um, they, they do stop producing testosterone and they do take uh, estrogen hormones. So, so there will be, far, you can't say that they have an advantage or that it becomes easy for them. Um, it takes a toll on the body also to undergo surgery. And one of my friends and interviewees for the book, uh, his name is Aryan Pasha, he is a trans man competing as a bodybuilder in the men's category and he actually won second place meet, beating a lot of cis men. Uh, so, and, and he's gone through a, f a tremendous journey so I don't think it become, it's easy for anyone in any sport. Uh, can, I, can I just say one thing? I, I find this question fascinating because the body, the sporty body is such a site of anxiety because how much is too much, how much is too little, what is natural, what is not natural, steroids, hormones. I mean, I find this a fascinating sight, precisely because it raises so many questions, it puts pressure on so many things. But rather than answering those questions, I think we really should sort of say, isn't it interesting that this arena um, that seems to be so gendered is bringing us to the limits and the expansiveness of what the body can and can't do, or what counts as the body, what counts as the natural body, and I just find that fascinating. Okay, the it really has to be a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, no, to answer the other question okay. about pronouns, I think, I think pronouns are, you, you leave it to the person to decide what pronoun he, she, they want to use. So that's to answer your question on pronouns. And, and, and thank you so much, Susan. And, but we all have to know that we are breaking the law when we use condoms because Section 377 says so. <laughs> OK. Well, look, thank you. Thank you to Madhavi and to, to Nandini and also to all of you for coming today and uh, being part of this fantastically interesting session. Thank you.